Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, now let's talk about obesity. So this is something that is such an important topic, and I'm sure that you may you may be aware of what obesity is, at least on a basic level. Uh, most people have um, know someone or you know have seen it. You know, you know, most people know what obesity is. Um, but it's very important to be properly educated on obesity and how to help obese patients and some of the options, because especially working here in America, um, you're going to see a lot of uh, issues around obesity. So we're going to talk a little bit about what it is, um, you know, what causes it, um, how we can help with it, and um, also just talk about from a nursing perspective, how to go in with an open mind and take good care of these patients. Um, so obesity is kind of when we talked about malnutrition earlier, obesity falls under malnutrition, but um, what's happening here with obesity is they're malnourished sometimes. And it's not always the case. Not everyone who's obese is malnourished. I'm not going to say that. I'm not trying to say that, but um, with obesity, sometimes there's issues where pretty much the body is, has too many nutrients or beyond the amount of nutrients that it needs. And what ends up happening is the body weight um, that a patient has is beyond what the body needs or requires. So, you know, we own, we require so much body fat um, and stuff for energy and for um, daily maintenance of um, different organs and things like that. Um, but when we get beyond that, we start ending up in uh, dangerous territory where we start to develop complications and have issues. Um, so risk factors for obesity, um, you know, most of the time when people see an obese patient, they, uh, not, not most of the time, I don't want to make this assumption for everyone, but many times people can look at an obese patient and assume they must have no self-control. They must like to eat a lot. And um, there is actually uh, different types of obesity. I, I don't know if the book calls it like primary and secondary, but it's something where sometimes there's like an unknown cause or sometimes there's like an, a different condition or certain disease processes that can lead to it. So um, we'll talk more about this later, but just going in with an open mind when you see an obese patient, um, if you go in with the attitude of, hey, this person, you know, made bad life decisions, or they obviously are not able to put the food down, you don't really know. So there's there's other things at play. Um, some people genetically are just more prone to obesity. Um, uh, certain disease processes, like I mentioned, um, hormonal disease processes, um, especially when you get into some endocrine disorders in complex, you'll learn more about those. Um, <clears throat> certain ethnicities are going to be more at risk. Um, Hispanic Americans, especially, we talk a lot about their risk for obesity. Uh, and then, of course, environmental and psychological factors, too. So there is uh, the book talks a lot about the, you know, kind of like using food as comfort or it kind of becomes like a, a part of like the, it gets stimulated by the pleasure center in the brain. So there is that as well. And sometimes for some people, it's all of the above. Um, so it, it definitely is a variety. The other environmental factors might be, you know, how um, a family might raise their um, children to eat. You know, I had a friend in nursing school that told me like, that she's like, man, I really want to lose weight. She's like, but when I go to um, family events, it's seen as disrespectful. You cannot leave the table until you eat at least three plates. And she said her grandmother would sit there right in her face until she finished every last bite of like three plates. And if not, it's seen as like a disgrace to her family. And so like there's, there is different um, cultural and other things um, that can play a role as well. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, like we've talked about before, we, we look at obesity usually by um, BMI and that's that height and weight measurement. And like I mentioned before, it's not the best measure. There's people that would be a normal BMI, but they could eat really unhealthy and not take good care of their body. So it, it's not always the best measure, or there's also people that are in the obese category that may be healthier than people in the normal BMI category. Um, so, but we do use this as a general measure. And of course on the exams, if it says that they're obese, we're not sitting there and, you know, reading between the lines or trying to figure out other possibilities. So um, obesity for the BMI is greater than 30. And then, like I mentioned in another video, extreme obesity is greater than 40 for your BMI. Uh, we also can look at waist circumference, um, waist circumference greater than 40 for men and greater than 35 for women is considered to increase your health risks and then a waist to hip ratio. Um, and again, we're not going to get too in depth with this. We're not going to make you measure anyone or do any math here, but um, just know that women, if the waist to hip ratio is 0.8 or less, um, then uh, what do you call it? Um, it's considered higher risk and men it's 1.0 or less um, is considered higher risk for that ratio. 
higher risk for health problems, if that makes sense. I mentioned earlier in another video about how we also consider other things like body shape. So um, where um, for people that are obese, where their body fat is stored can have a difference on the health problems they have. And this makes sense because, you know, where a lot of the fat is creating problems, like, you know, where it's creating pressure or creating issues would make sense where it would have more health problems. So like for me, I am all pear. I am a pear shaped um, uh, woman that, um, has, I have most of my fat in my thighs and in my hips. Um, and so as a result of that, um, <clears throat> Um, you know, much more at risk for things like you think of things like arthritis, um, osteoporosis, um, uh, we are more likely to have varicose veins. If you go back and remember cardiac, um, you're going to be much more likely to um, build up pressure in your legs and the blood vessels in your legs. Um, cellulite too, just because of where the fat is accumulating. Whereas the apple shape, um, they keep most of their fat in their abdominal area and upper body. So they usually have larger breasts or chest area. Um, and like a lot of their fat is in their stomach. And so these patients are going to be more higher risk for heart disease, diabetes, cancer, insulin issues. Um, cardiovascular disease and um, which I already said, but like specifically high blood pressure and then cholesterol issues. Now it's not to say I'm not sitting over here like, <laughs> thank God I'm a pair. I'll never get cardiovascular disease. Like I wish, um, but this, this not saying like it's an end all be all, but sometimes the shape or where the fat is mostly, um, I want to say landing or um, distributing itself that can sometimes tell a little bit about your risk for certain things, but it's not the end all be all. It's not that you go into the doctor and they're like, Hey, you're an apple sitting there. And it's like, we got to get you to the cath lab right now. Like it's not based on that alone. We have to look at, um, the whole picture. So what's the big problem with obesity? Why do we care so much? Um, well with obesity, everything leads to too much pressure. Um, so pressure can push up on the lungs and it leads it kind of like when you're pregnant and you're unable to take deep breaths because it puts excess pressure where your lungs can't expand the same way. Um, it puts pressure on your diaphragm, which leads it to be harder for um, really good um, oxygenation ventilation, especially that ventilation. Uh, that also pushes down on our joints. And so when you have extra pressure, which is, you know, definitely on top, I've talked about having arthritis on top of, you know, having a previous injury in my knee, it doesn't help that I got thighs that don't quit. And so that puts extra pressure on my joints and uh, makes it harder, which makes a lot more sense why my knees are most effective when I have pain and problems, my knees are most affected, because that's where most of my weight is being carried. Um, there's also pressure against the heart. So it makes it harder for the heart to expand, which leads to, I know, so sad, decreased cardiac output. I know, don't you miss cardiac? I know I do. Um, and then, um, you know, also just the fact that having obesity in itself, um, aside from just the extra um, weight and stuff that's causing pressure and pushing, um, obesity itself is a like independent risk factor for a lot of issues like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancers. Um, so it's definitely something to keep in mind that we want to um, avoid decrease, et cetera. And the book talks about, um, you know, for medical treatments that even like a modest weight loss, like, um, you know, like a five or 10% weight loss of what, uh, even if they're not necessarily back in the normal BMI category can make significant difference in how a person's quality of life is and how their overall health is. So, um, you know, sometimes it's really hard. There's a big psychological component with weight loss. Um, but just as the nurse being, I, I'm going to talk about the nurse's role here more of this. I'm going to try not to get on a soapbox, but I'm going to get on a little bit. Um, and, um, you know, just remembering that uh, these encouraging medical treatments, even when it seems like, man, it's not working, it's taking forever, I've got a long way to go, that letting them know that it can make a big difference in their um, health risks. So um, if it's not lifestyle or, um, you know, just environment related, we do want to treat the underlying cause. Like if they have a medication they're on or um, a disease process that can be treated, we want to treat that underlying cause. Because again, if, if it is some other issue, we can change lifestyle all day long, but it's not going to necessarily make a difference. Then the lifestyle changes with exercise and nutrition um, is definitely going to be super important for these patients. 
And then support groups are a big part of um, treatment for obesity. Um, being around other people that have been through similar journeys that understand it, because a lot of times patients that are obese feel a lot of separation between themselves and their healthcare providers, feel a lot of judgment. And so um, having support groups, people to talk to, people to journey with and to support each other, the accountability, and then also just the emotional support can make a big difference. We'll talk more about those too. Um, education for these patients is so key. And then, um, you know, the last or most invasive option would be bariatric surgeries if they're high risk or unable to lose weight. Um, and I'm going to have a separate video specifically on bariatric surgery. Um, but something to keep in mind too with these patients, another option, which I don't have list here, your book talks a little bit about it is there are new like medical therapies. I'm sure you see them like some of them are actually like there's like shots or injections that you can get. Some of them are sub Q or IM. Um, and a lot of them are like anti-diabetic drugs and things like that. Sometimes insurance will cover them depending on if you have like a sign that your health is not good and you need um, like to improve that. But sometimes they definitely do not. Um, and so it can be very expensive. But a lot of times the the key thing to think here with medical treatments, again, if I'm thinking, you know, there's some pill I can take and, you know, there was, um, uh, what do you call it, phenamine or whatever that was really popular for a while. Um, we're really, when we're looking at medical treatments for obesity, if there's a medical problem, we want to treat the underlying issue, but we want to stay away from short, quick fixes um, and really want to think long-term for how we can help these people um, have stable health, um, healthy weight loss that can be sustained and not just, um, you know, um, lose a little bit, gain it back, lose a little bit, gain it back. Cause, um, eating disorders and obesity go hand in hand. And there's a, there's a strong connection. It's not to say that every person who's obese has an eating disorder, but a lot of times there's disordered eating in patients that are obese and, um, it can definitely make it harder when there's that psychological component, but I'll talk more about that. So um, here's my little soapbox. So as being someone who could be classified as obese and um, as someone who struggled with a lot of this stuff, eating disorders and um, difficulty with weight for a lot of my life, it can be really hard. And, um, you know, going to the doctor, you know, I've, I've had all the approaches. I've had a doctor be like, here's where you are and here's where you're supposed to be. And I'm um, thinking like, if I see that, I'm going to be like, oh oh my God, I was so unaware. Like, you know, now I'm ready to finally change. And like, you know, I've had some good doctors and I've had some not so good doctors and it definitely can be quite a struggle um, sometimes to really um, feel like, uh, we caught that you're being heard. So um, it's definitely difficult. And I mean, as a nurse, I've seen it, you know, it, I've seen the other nurses, you know, an obese patient comes in um, and sometimes it can be really hard. The first thing they say is like, oh my God, my back, I'm going to kill my back. And I, I get it. And there, but there's some things to say out loud and there's some things to, you know, if you have that thought or that feeling, if you want to say that, but maybe not near or close to the patient where they possibly could hear it. Um, so just realizing that there's a lot more here and that a lot of these patients, they come in in pretty, you know, rough state sometimes because they've avoided healthcare for a reason. They don't feel safe. They don't feel supported or protected or cared for. And so um, just kind of working on um, yourself as an individual, you know, before you step in these rooms, before you take care of one of these patients, I'm um, really checking yourself to see where your mind is around these things. Um, it's really easy to see and just say like, oh man, it's, it's just a lack of self-control, but there's, you're going to find very few patients that literally are just like, yeah, I just have no self-control and then they can regain it and they're fine. Like these are complex health, mental, physical, psychological issues going on. And so just keeping in mind that there might be more there than what you think there is and um, being open to the possibility um, that there might be something else going on too. Like, you know, it's not that we need to go down some rabbit hole that they have like, cause it's very rare for these patients also to have like a medical condition alone that's causing this. Like usually there's multifactorial, but um, but just being willing to listen to your patient, being willing to hear them, um, use appropriate equipment to protect yourself. But, um, you know, I know, you know, and I, I've, I'm obviously not obese where I can't, you know, turn myself in a bed or I've obviously an ambulatory, um, everyday person getting up and moving myself. But, you know, when you're going in there and thinking, oh man, I got to turn this patient. Oh God, this is going to be so hard. Or, you know, like, you know, all oh, my back or, you know, like stuff like that. They have devices now that we can use, make sure you're using them. 
And then um, as much as it's hard for you, imagine how hard it must be for a patient who cannot turn themselves, clean themselves, do that stuff. Like none of these patients wanted this for themselves. None of them enjoy it um, that I've ever met. You know, most of them feel a lot of shame. So just always try to put yourself in someone else's shoes because you just never know Um you know, a lot of times until you're on that other side and you're that patient in the bed and you're completely out of control. Again, even if you're not obese, it's not about that. It's just about having to completely trust someone else to take care of you and your body when you're out of control and you're not able to do that for yourself. It's it's very humbling. So just keep an open mind when you are um, taking care of these patients and really try to um, check your own values and check your own thoughts around this. And it's not that you necessarily have to agree with it. I'm not saying that there's not some, you know, personality and, you know, psychological things going on here, but um, just don't set yourself short that that's the only thing that's going on too. Anyway, soapbox done. Um, but yeah, so it's a lifelong battle. So as the nurse, we really want to set these patients up to help them long term, not just right now. We're not just trying to get them, hey, let me help you to lose 20 pounds really quick so that you're doing better. Um, <clears throat> we want them to find something that they can sustain. So um, nutritional therapy and working with a nutritionist is super helpful, um, especially if they have things like eating disorders or if they have issues that cause them to um, make it hard to lose weight, like people that have polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. Um, you know, working with a nutritionist because there's certain foods that really trigger them to um, gain weight and make it very hard to lose weight. So um, get eating the right foods a lot of times. And then working with a nutritionist too can help them to find foods that they're actually going to enjoy. Um, versus uh, just foods like, you know, like, I mean, like anyone, mo most people know what healthy foods are, but finding foods that they actually can enjoy that are healthy for them, it's going to be something that they can sustain. Um, so we want to encourage people to make permanent lifestyle changes and not to look for a diet, but more look for like, how can I um, incorporate more And something, you know, that I usually tell patients, this is something that has helped me a lot is instead of trying to, you know, like, cut something completely out of your life or just be like, I can't eat this or this is not good for me. Um, it's just all about like edging it out. So sometimes I'll tell patients like, instead of saying like, oh my goodness, I can't have this. Um, this is not good for me. Like, you know, like, let's say you really like carbs or, you know, potatoes or something like that. Still have some, but maybe edge it out, try to add in something else. And what I try to do is eat that um, healthier food, start with that healthier food and fill up on that a little bit more first before the other foods, um, things like that. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, my cat's tail. I was like, what is that hairy thing next to me? <laughs> and that sounds really dirty, but I swear it was not dirty. Um, it was just my cat. Um, like I said, there's always someone on or near me, um, at all times. It seems so lucky. Um, one day I'll be alone. I can't wait. Um, anyway, so, um, you know, you want to really uh, tell them about like little manageable things. Cause again, this can be so overwhelming. And if you tell a, a person who's maybe never dieted or done a lot of diets that all of a sudden they're going to not be able to eat X, Y, and Z foods and like these major changes, it can be so, you know, like, oh, daunting. Um, but if you just keep it simple and say, okay, let's look at some little changes you can make. And like I said, I, I try to like edge things out, um, make more room for healthier foods by ed like, you know, adding in more healthy foods, but still keeping foods that I like too. And then um, finding that balance. Um, realistic, healthy goals. Um, there's lots of technology out there. My fitness pal. Um, I used to love um, what really motivated me, especially when I was in nursing school um, and uh, was like with other students, I would get like the Fitbit challenges and stuff like that. I thought those were a lot of fun. And like my husband would always be laughing at me because it would be like, 11 30 at night and I was like oh my god blah 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 just pass me on the Fitbit challenge and I have to like get up and run outside or run in place and try to get those last steps in to beat them to beat the challenge so sometimes like you know competition if you're a competitive person um things like that and then there's also like I mentioned support groups um there's a lot of like weight watchers I think your book talks about tops too like you know it's just meeting with other people and again there, there's different solutions for different people there's um 12 step support programs um some people find that um the traditional ways of um you know weighing measuring focusing on the food makes things worse and so overuse anonymous kind of gets more to the to a deeper issue and um uh, really helps to get to the bottom of uh, maybe what's driving 
doing a lot of the, you know, unhealthy or disordered eating. So some people find that that's where they need to go um, in order to get the help that they need. But through these, there's um, partners, sponsors, um, you know, um, other people, accountability people to, to do these programs with. And so it really helps to, like I said, to have um, someone that you can relate to who understands is at your level and can also provide some feedback um, to help you to make those changes. But yeah. Um, that's a lot of the nursing care. The only other things I would say is, you know, of course, um, as the nurse, we're just watching their weight closely. Um, we're looking for signs of complications, doing frequent like, um, you know, assessments to their organs and body systems that can be commonly affected, like their lungs. I'm always, I'm seeing like most of the time their lungs are going to be diminished because they're not taking deep breaths. So I might need to encourage them like, you know, incentive spirometer. And we'll talk more about this, like post-op, they're very high risk for complications, but watching their lungs, their heart closely, I'm looking for them experiencing any long-term complications. Um, and then um, <clears throat> again, providing a, um, an encouragement, you know, a, lo a lot of times, and I promise this is the last thing I'll say about it, but a lot of times, you know, people think like tough love and stuff like that is going to be what um, helps. And for some people, tough love does work, but I, I found generally for myself and for the patients that I've cared for um, that um, tough love can sometimes not necessarily always be the best thing. Like, you know, I know you see it on TV and it seems like the cool thing to do, like giving tough tough love to your patients or, um, you know, like maybe it's going to like change their mind, you know, but you know, nine times out of 10, what they really just need is you to treat them like anyone else who's um, coming into your hospital and, um, you know, just giving them the same tools and resources that they need. Cause a lot of times, and, and also just like I would always say with like smoking patients, you might have a patient who smoked for 40 years. So you're like, well, obviously they're still smoking. So there's no point in me providing education, but you just never know. Don't assume just because a patient's been overweight for years that they know what to do. Um, so just talk to them. And I mean, see if they're open to it. It's not that you need to see them and see them straight away and just be like, hey, let's talk about how you can lose weight because maybe they're not interested in doing that. Um, but um, just talking to them like, you know, and sharing experience, having an open mind and again, realizing they're in a position of vulnerability and just being that support for them. OK, before I go on another tangent, I think that's it for this one. Yeah, the next uh, PowerPoint is going to be about bariatric surgery. See you for that one.